Okay, so our first question is from Daniel Abramovich. Daniel, are you on? Yeah, hi, I'm over here. Hi, Daniel. Would you like to ask a question? Uh, well, my question was actually not for the business, but more for the personal use of uh, paying rent. Is there already any decisions from the government about uh rental payments you know for the landlord any benefits discounts i don't know anything that's the question <laughs> michael would you like to take that question okay so um maybe that andrew has some uh, input on this one as well but uh to my knowledge there's nothing from the government to help with rent um business rates yes but andrew can tell you more about that um what you can do with your landlord is to explain the situation with them and uh, explain what you can and what you can't do. The key thing is keeping a dialogue with the landlord as well. Um, don't just not pay the rent, rather have a, rather speak with them and, and agree um, a discount or agree a, 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 a rental holiday um, and see what you can come up with. Um, but the government hasn't come up with anything specifically for rent there are some uh, some loan schemes which are meant to be, be available um, but they do come with some caveats I don't know Andrew you can add any more to that yeah um, correct me if I'm wrong but I think there uh, I, I, I think that landlords can't evict tenants at the moment i believe that's right Andrew. yeah um so For three months For three months yeah so um if you do have problems and you can't pay your rent i i don't think the landlords can send in bailiffs but um i'm not 100 percent sure on that but uh that's what that's what i've heard that you know you can't be turfed out onto the street uh, if you're talking about personal rent as opposed to business rent um and and you know, I, I totally agree with Michael. I mean, the end, end of it is about dialogue. A lot of landlords are quite, um, they, they do live in the real world and they do realise that um, they, you know, in order to maintain their income for the future, they have to, um, you know, they have to be a little bit uh, prepared to accept a, a reduced cash flow now, maybe pay, pay reduce some over a few months. A lot of commercial landlords uh, who are previously, you know, your rent was payable on a quarter day um, and you pay three months up, up front are agreeing to uh, staged payments. At the end of the day, um, you know, a landlord is not going to be particularly wanting to evict a tenant, whether commercial or, or personal, because in today's environment, they don't. They want their tenants to stay in place. There's a lot of un there's more uncertainty about getting a new tenant in, and lots of people are you know the market is going to be dead now. People are going to be staying where they are. So I, I think um, it's a commercial decision really, not a legal decision from land from the government. Um, and so it's just best to have a dialogue with your landlord. I agree with Michael. Yeah. We've just had a question in that's asked about um, commercial rent as well. Is that the, would that be the same situation as personal rent? I'm not sure if that's the same situation with regard to being booted out of your premises. But with commercial rent, a lot of clients that I'm dealing with are talking to their landlords and are either getting a deferral of rent. So um, I, I've got one client in particular who hasn't paid his March to June quarter. No, he has paid his March quarter rent, but his next quarter rent he's not going to pay because his landlords agreed for him to spread that rent over the remainder of the year. Um, so this is all about conversation with your with your landlord. The worst thing you can do is is just not to pay it because that creates a bad atmosphere. And and the um, for landlord, it's not just how much you're paying, but the quality of tenant. And the more you co you communicate with that landlord, the more the better he will see you as a as a tenant going forward. Um, so he's more likely to want to keep you on afterwards, even if you haven't paid for a while, given the circumstances. Does that answer? Does that answer your questions? Uh, yes, actually, I also have a business, um, and also I'm I'm thinking about what if if I should pay the the future rent uh, for the business and. Same for the house, I need to communicate with them, obviously. But um, I have a shop in a shopping center and um, we're not too sure uh, how we should proceed because now the center is closed and 
should we pay the for the future rent if there's no uh, any business there's no footfall or anything um but yeah it's also very hard to do to communicate because not everyone is communicative in this uh period of time uh, as i wish to but yeah you need to communicate with the landlord really and explain yeah. the situation because also i mean he's not going to rent that shop out to anybody given the circumstances yeah obviously and i know of one of, of one uh, uh business contact of mine who is in a uh he's in an office he's in an office shared office um, environment um and he's given notice on his office and the landlord is is it's the same that you can just stay he went free he's been there five years he can't rent it out to anybody else and he wants him back afterwards um the landlords want to hibernate rather than get rid of their business altogether yeah i, I think the tenant is in a position of strength relatively <laughs> uh compared yes. to how we were a year ago three years ago up until now, up until this crisis, um, you know, landlords have had, had the upper hand because there's been a lot of demand and not much supply. Um, uh, but now it's gone, the other, it, it, it's gone the other way around. Supply is going to exceed demand. So I, I think um, tenants should be in a relatively strong position as long as they, that, you know, that they act in a professional way and in a good way. Agree with that. Can we cover um, mortgages as well as rentals? So there's been a lot in the press about um, residential mortgages being able to apply for a three month holiday. Mm -hmm. Also, um, we've had a question coming through that our commercial landlords are able to apply for that same um, mortgage holiday. So therefore being able to pass on their savings to their tenants. So um, is that a question to me? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, with residential, uh, with, res with, res with, yeah, with residential mortgages, when you contact the bank, you've got to be quite um, aware of how they deal with these kind of inquiries. Uh, yes, the banks are being are being encouraged to offer um, uh, uh, their clients a three-month mortgage holiday, um, but it's not law; they don't have to do it, and. Um, we haven't worked in a bank previously. Um, it takes an awfully long time to retrain staff to, to with different processes. And what you don't want to happen is for them to classify as somebody who's having difficulty meeting meeting their payments, and because that, that may well affect your credit your your credit rating. Um, every bank is different, uh, and it's quite a new thing. Um, what I could do is if you want me to, I could speak to some of my colleagues and see if they've had any experience directly of, of this. But what I, would be, what I would say is be careful when you speak to your, when you call it your lender and ask them what the process is for the three month mortgage holiday before you reveal your personal circumstances. Um, you don't want to tell them you're in financial difficulty because then that will affect your credit rating. And that may, might make it difficult, difficult for you to borrow money in the future, should you need, should you need to. I think the uh, I think they did say that it shouldn't affect your credit rating if you do apply for this, but I I wouldn't necessarily believe that. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I would be very very wary about. Uh, obviously, if you need to um, uh, postpone your mortgage payments, then you have to do it. If, you know, you've got to put food on the table, uh, for for instance. But if it's just something you feel. I can do that. I, I, if you if you can afford to pay your mortgage, um, I, the mortgage is going to have to be paid at some point in time anyway. It's not like it's a freebie. It's not like a grant that you get yes. to keep. Uh, so your mortgage is going to have to be paid at some point. So even if you did pay it, um, you, you're, you're still benef benefiting yourself. Um, and I, I, I would always exercise caution about um postponing mortgage payments because um you we just don't know what could happen further down the line when you get a question on a questionnaire have you ever uh postponed your mortgage payment so you'll you have to answer yes to that question and so we, we we just don't know and i i would just exercise caution with that and if you can afford to pay your mortgage my personal view is just continue paying yeah. it yeah uh, rather than trying to see if you can get something off the government or the mortgage company because it's available uh, I, I'm, I, 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 I wouldn't do that myself there is one other thing that you might find might be helpful to some people 
if there are people here who are on repayment mortgages, that's where you're paying the capital and the interest, often the banks will have, will have a criteria to enable you to um, switch to interest only, even if you're in the middle of a fixed rate. So you're tied in for a period of time to a particular rate. Um, the bank's criteria are different for each different bank, but you can do that often without affecting your credit rating at all. Um, and then later on down the line, when things improve, you can go back. But it's important to remember to go back and not get used to having uh, lower outgoings. But for the moment, it could have an have, help you with your cash flow until, until things improve again. Um, there's a question about commercial mortgages as well. Yes. Um, that's not an area that I'm particularly involved with myself. Um, but I could take it away and come back. Unless Andrew has any ideas about this one? Yeah, I think I think buy to let mortgages are in the same boat. If on a buy to buy to let, you can potentially uh, get a hol get a postponement on a buy to let as well. That's uh, my understanding. Uh, too. Probably it's the same criteria. On the chat function, I don't know if everyone's got their chat function up, but people are sending messages in and, yeah. and somebody said, um, in respect to commercial mortgages, most lenders are being very understanding, offering clients up to six month capital repayment holiday. So I think, you know, I, I think the truth of the matter is, is people need to use their, the banks as well as us need to use our common sense at the moment. So they are trying to make, mostly trying to make good decisions to help keep things um, afloat. Uh, we've had loads of questions in, Andrew, Michael, you might be able to take a little bit of a breather now, but we've had loads of questions in about all of the self-employed status and, um, and, and the government support there. So if we can kick off with those. Um, we've had a question in, I've been self-employed for less than three years. How will they calculate my grant? Um, is that, that's a question to me, <laughs> yes? Um, <laughs> Well, 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 first of all, the, the first criteria uh, is um, you had to have been self-employed as of 5th of April 19. But obviously, if it's about three years or less than three years, then you, you would have been self-employed at 5th of April 19. Um, and then um, there's a couple of other criteria. Uh, first of all, your average profits must be less than £50,000. That's not your gross income before expenses, but that's your taxable profit that you would show on your tax return uh, and it's got to average uh, at least uh, it's got to average less than fifty thousand pounds over the three-year period and also the other criteria is your self-employment income must be more than fifty percent of your total income so if you for example you have self-employment income but you have a quite a lot of buy to let income as an example or dividend income and that other income is more than 50% of your total income, that would disqualify you. Um, the way it's going to work is, well, we actually don't know exactly yet how things are going to pan out. But on self-employment, there's nothing to be done initially by, by the individual, because HMRC are going to contact everybody who they think it applies to. Now, hopefully they'll catch everybody, and they, I believe, will tell them whether they're eligible. Now, I think it's going to be an HMRC-driven thing. I'm not sure if they're going to just say, we believe you're eligible, now give us your numbers. I think they, they've got all the numbers. It's all there on their IT system. So I'm imagining that uh, HMRC will tell people that they're eligible and, and they will then invite you to go to the next stage, whatever that next stage looks like. But my understanding it'll be your average monthly profits over the three year period um, up to 1819 and if you've started during that period it would probably be from the date that you started don't know for sure there's no word on it yet there's, there's little detail but it'll be since you started to the 5th of April 19 your average monthly profits and then 80% of that subject to a cap of £2,500. Uh, we've had a, just a question in on that, which is um, when do you think HMRC, when they'll start contacting people? So my understanding is, is they're expecting to be able to make the payments in June. So they'd probably start contacting people May time. What do you think, Andrew? Yeah, uh, for, first of all, uh, I think they're gonna be building the system for employees 
I can't see them. Uh, they might do them both at the same time, but they've got to get the employee system set up first um, because they, those payments have got to be made by the end of April. Uh, so, and the, the, the self-employed payments will not be paid till June, as you said. So I, I would agree with you. I don't think we'll hear anything from HMRC on self-employment until, until May. Okay. On self, the self-employed, not for employees. More on the self-employed. So somebody asked us that they, um, they knew that 1920 was going to be a, 1920 was going to be a bad year for them. So they asked to make a lower payment on account and they're concerned that this will affect the amount they receive in grant. It, it shouldn't do. It'll be purely based on the period up to eight, up to the 5th of April 19. So what they, what, how they do this year, um, I mean, yeah, one of the overriding criteria is if you, you, you're only actually eligible if COVID-19 has affected your trade, right? Now, obviously that's gonna affect most people, um, but so as long as COVID-19 has affected your trade, you should be claimed on the basis of your uh, taxable profits up to the 5th of April 19, and how you're doing this year is irrelevant. Okay. And indeed, indeed their payment that is due in July, their reduced payment, can be deferred until the end of January. I think it's you can automatically defer it, can't you? It's, you don't even need to request. You don't. You don't even need to. But some people might want to pay it. Uh, some people do want to pay it. Um, but you, 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 HMRC will probably not demand the money from you or send a statement saying due January or, or whatever. We don't know. But you, you, you don't have to make a July payment. Someone said, if you're self-employed and already drawing a pension, will you be ineligible? This is going to be. This is going to depend very much on how much of your income is coming from self-employment, as Andrew had said before. So, if half of your income is from self-employment, or more than half of your income is from self-employment, then uh, it should have an impact on your eligibility. If most of it's from pension over the last three years, average over the last three years, then it may well have an impact. I think the thing to do would be to look at your tax returns the past three years and see what portion of your income is from self-employment and what portion is from other sources. The, the, I agree. I mean, just from a uh, a computational point of view, uh, you should have a, most individuals who file a tax return would have a tax calculation mm. that they can produce either from their return or their accountants produce it for them. And that ca tax calculation that is that goes with your tax return will clearly show what your taxable income is uh, and how much is from self-employment and how much is from other sources. Sometimes it's quite complicated to, not for me, but for you know, people that are not accountants to work out what their income is from their tax return. So the best thing to look at is their tax calculation, which is produced alongside the tax return. And if somebody is a landlord and that's their self-employment and so they get um, they get rent payments in, does that count as their self-employed um, income? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Uh, um, so, so, um, rental income is, uh, yes, people may feel they're self-employed and I would tend to agree with them on a personal level that being a, a landlord is self-employed, but from a tax point of view, uh, being a landlord doesn't, cla doesn't classify as being self-employed. It's just income from a trade or a profession that is uh, self-employment income and not, and not rental income or pension income or dividend income. Mm -hmm. We've had another question in saying that if the year to 20, April 2020 was their best year yet, um, how will that be taken into account of it? And the answer is, is it just won't, will it? No, I don't believe, I don't believe it will. But, you know, uh, yeah, uh, it, that, that, it depends on their profits in the years up to 5th of April 19. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as COVID-19 has affected their income now. So if they, I don't know, if they're lucky enough to be able to continue with maintaining their income at the same level as before, they won't be eligible. They won't be eligible. They're, it's difficult to know how they're gonna measure this, but your income must have been adversely affected by COVID-19 for, for you to be able to claim the, the grant. Okay. Um, we're gonna move on now to furloughing, the new word in everybody's dictionary that nobody but farmers knew before, I think. <laughs> and Zev Posen, I think you're on here, Zev, if you'd like to unmute yourself and you've got a question about furloughing. Uh, yes, right. So 
Uh, a few questions, just one to start with. New starters, people who have just started working in a new company, um, their first month was actually March. They cannot get this furlough grant, or how does that work? Um, can I, do you want me to answer that? Yes, please. Uh, that, yeah, that is unfortunately correct. They had to have been on the payroll as of 28th of February 2020. So it's literally two days they, they could have missed that out. Like if they were on the payroll, um, I suppose it works on a monthly basis. So you can't just be on the payroll uh, for two days. So it would have to be the entire February that they were on the payroll. And they would have had to have been on the payroll or employed as of 28th of February 2020. Right. Yeah. Zeb, I've seen people. I've seen people saying that um, if they were employed by somebody else up to the twenty eighth of February, they can go back to their old employer and ask them to be put back on the payroll and, and furloughed so, by them. That, that, that's discretionary. Yeah. I mean, if, if people have left their old employer, they're unlikely to be treated. You know, they might not be treated kindly like that. But um, they can ask. There's no harm in asking. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't furlough mean that you have to pay the employee twenty percent of the of the costs? Eighty percent comes from the government, isn't that right? Eighty. Um, yeah. Come on. Sorry. Come on, Andrew. Well, if you're furloughed, um, then the the uh, employee is in, can get eighty percent of their salary. Right. Um, uh, and it's up to the employer whether they pay the other twenty percent. Um, and then the employer cover the eighty percent though. So um, one of the, just a general question, Andrew, it might be useful just to go through, how does employee furloughing work? Well, there's a, there's, again, there's no uh, guidance on it. Um, and it is a bit of a legal question as to how an employee is furloughed. But generally the, the employer has to have a discussion with the employee and there should be some sort of <coughs> To, to the employee or email or letter and the employee should needs to agree to be furloughed uh, in order to to, to to go on the scheme so there is a bit of a process there are some standard letters out there on the net um, but yes uh, a, an employee can be uh, the employer has to communicate that to the employee that they are furloughed they have to write to them uh, and get, get the employee's agreement. Um, ideally, uh, what I do say to employers is that, strictly speaking, it's a legal issue. They should get some uh, legal advice from uh, an employment lawyer, um, but I appreciate that uh, it might not be, time is of the essence, and sometimes it's just not appropriate to, 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 to get legal advice, but strictly, if you want a legal answer, you need to ask a lawyer as to, because sometimes you could put something in a letter that is, contradicts the, an employee's uh, uh, contract of employment, uh, for instance. Um, but, but generally speaking, as long as it's communicated with the employee and it, the terms are explained. Go on, Zev. Right. Um, also, how does it work in terms of proving that the furloughed workers are not actually continuing to work? Is there something HMRC will want to have as proof on how are they how they handle that? Well, you're going to need to have the proof yourself. First of all, you're going to tell your employee not to work, right? You're going to put that in writing to them. It's effectively they're laid off. It's a temporary layoff. It's like being made redundant. They can't work. You have to tell them that they're not doing it, right? Uh, and and so you have to police that yourself. Um, and at, at the end of the day, there may be audits from HMRC after the event. Um, and if they see that employees have been doing work, um, you know, they could look at your um, invoices out to clients, for example. I don't know what business you're in. Um, th there are ways of auditing it. Whether they will is another matter, um, but you, you've got to follow the, 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 let the letter of the law. Um, th these are the times we're in. And so, yeah, th there's no work to be done by the employee. Um, if they're furloughed, you just, you, they're just, you know, you can ask them, I suppose, how they are, that kind of thing. And you, you can review it. What you do need to do is you need to set out in your furlough letter when, when it's going to be reviewed. You just don't say you're furloughed and that's it. 
we won't, you won't hear from us again. You could say, this will be subject to review in three or four weeks time. Yeah, so there is a process. You can write, communicate with your employees, but you can't ask them to do work. So if you go and ask them to do something for you, you've breached the furlough. And, and ultimately, the price will be paid by you, the employer, not the employee. Because the, you know, the employee is going to get 80% of their salary. So they're all right, they've been paid. But if you've breached it, then the, the government won't pay you the grant or they'll take the grant back off of you. So it, it's something to be taken seriously and it's a cost that you will ultimately have to pay as an employer if you breach it. If a furlough letter is sent uh, at the end of March, you can't then say this employee was furloughed from the beginning of March. Uh, absolutely no way. No, as with everything, it can't be retrospective. It's got to be from now on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in terms of the HMRC working out the average pay, uh, which they which they'll give for the grant, how do how do they do that if an employee has uh, different amounts each month and some months doesn't get anything, some months gets, you know, yeah. how does that work? Well, well, first of all, HMRC doesn't work it out. This is one thing is slightly different to self-employment. On an employee, the employer works it out. Um, and there's a portal being built by HMRC. Um, I don't know what the questions are going to be, uh, but your employers will be uploading data to that portal. Uh, how I don't know, but we will. Um, and and for those uh, employees whose salary varies, um, it will depend on uh, either their average pay for the 1920 tax year or their pay for the same month in the previous tax year. So there is a mechanism for those that uh, employees pay varies. Um, you just need to, you know, you'll need to check that out at the time. But there you is know, a mechanism in that. Right. Do you know if that averaging means if they only actually got paid in three or four months, do they take that and divide that by 12? Or they say, well, the months that they got paid will average those months. I don't, I don't know. That, that, that's quite a deep, that's an intricate question. It's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that at, at that mm -hmm. point in time. I mean, it may well be if they were employed in that month. If they were still employed, then you may have to take that month. Um, so uh, there were probably some rules on zero you know zero hours contracts and that 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 would be, need to be checked nearer the time but that that's uh that is a yeah we, that would need to be looked at and that would be taken into account yeah and employees on statute of maternity leave if the employer is paying um like a top up on top of the on top of the smp so is that top up covered under this grant so 80 percent of the top up yeah well, again, there's nothing available. There's nothing out there on that. Uh, absolutely nothing at all. But all I could say is, logically, it should be. You should be able to claim 80% of the top up. Um, whether when you get onto the portal, whether it allows you to put that in or it takes it out, I don't. I don't know. But you're, it's a good, very good question. And but I, I would hope uh, that that the top up would be eligible for the 80%. Yes. And uh, one last thing, if I just jump in. So do we know Do we know for sure that it's going to be March, April, May, or it's possible they'll continue it in June, or how's that? It's going to be reviewed after three months. It'll be reviewed. Right. Right. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Right. Max, right. Which girl, you're a bit camera shy today, but I don't know if you want to unmute yourself. Okay, here I am. Question. Hello. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, I'm a very uh, small, limited company. For reasons that I can't remember, my accountant advised me not to be self-employed, but to be a limited company, and I've got one employee. So my first question is, how do I, I think someone else asked on the chat as well, how do I claim for myself as the boss or the managing director, and is it, exactly the same as you've just been describing for self-employed that we as bosses we have to write to the employee and tell them they're furloughed is that the, does that apply in the same way shall i answer that yes yeah, um well for your employee you said you've got an employee so yeah um, yeah you're also a co-director by the way i don't know if that affects things um well 
the, the basic premise is that employee or director has to be furloughed, uh, has to be eligible for furlough, has to be eligible. So it depends what they're doing. If they're still doing um, work for the company, and I put that in inverted commas work because um, co company directors have fallen between the cracks in all this, uh, all these announcements. They, 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 they've made uh, an out reliefs available for employees and for self-employed, but company directors are, are forgotten, have been forgotten about. Um, and um, most company directors, are, I, I don't know about in your case, but most company directors have been advised by their accountants to take a minimum salary and, and take the re remainder of their payout as dividends. Um, so if, if they take a small salary, um, then even if they're eligible for furloughing, it's only 80% of their salary, which would be um, reclaimable from the government and not 80% of their dividends. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, so getting to your question, a director under law could theoretically be furloughed, but he has to have been effectively doing, has to be doing no work for the company. To be, to be furloughed you know again it's like temporary leave of absence um, but there is a case for saying a director can do certain things because he has to do them under the law he has to you know he's got responsibilities so whilst there's no guidance on it you know you could argue that as a director you need to file your returns um, and write up your books. But that doesn't have to be done now though, does it? I mean, like, no. if I furlough the director, I can say, right, for the next three months, put whatever, put everything on hold, and um, we'll, you know, do the counts when I reinstate instate you. Yeah, you, 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 you can do that. I, I, think you, I think you can do that. There's no guidance on it, right. but if you furlough yourself, if you just, and you, you, you just tell your customers, um, you know, I've been furloughed um, and I will respond to your email as soon as I can, then um, that would probably comply. But if you engage with your clients, which oh. you would want to do probably, um, that, that, that may invalidate the furlough. Are you talking about me as the main as director? Any director. Oh, right. I was talking about the, I thought you were talking about the employee who's also a director. Well, exactly, because he's a director. He's a director as well. Oh. From their point of view, I can say to the, the employee, you know, don't do any work. You know, I can manage without you for three months. Yeah, but, temp temporary leave of absence, yes. Yeah, so that would that work the same way as for, for lowering an employee, st a straight employee? It should, it should do. It should do. Yeah, but going back to me, you're saying... I have to furlough my... See, the thing is, in my situation, I've got a little bit of work coming in. Obviously, my work's been massively affected by COVID, but um, I've still got some... I'm still doing some work. Yeah. So I don't... I can't furlough myself because that would mean I wouldn't be able to do anything. Well, I could do that, I suppose, but well, then... You see, this is the um, uh, inequality of it. You, 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 you wouldn't qualify for furloughing because um, you're doing a little bit of work. But if you were self-employed, i.e. not a limited company, mm. you would be able to claim it back. Because for a self-employed individual, not for a company, limited company, you only have to demonstrate that you're adversely affected. Not mm. that it's gone down to zero, but in a limited company, which is what you're in, mm. um, you'd have to do, doing a little bit of work would invalidate it. Really? Yeah. And Andrew, how would, how would a company director communicate to themselves that they are furloughed? Would they just... Very, very good <laughs> question. <laughs> well, write to myself. Write to yourself or hold a director's board minute. Uh, you could have a director's board minute, for, uh, potentially. That's so, before furloughing the other director, presumably. Well, the furloughing the other one, you do have to write a letter to him. Yeah. You write a letter I'm to saying him. you have a board meeting, I have to have it with someone else, don't I? Yeah. Yeah, well, you could do, exactly. Good point. Yeah, yeah, you would do. I mean, I'm just thinking of a board meeting off the top of my head. You yeah. know, who, who's to say whether you've got to write to yourself as a one? Are the RHMRC going to ask you for the letter to yourself? <laughs> well, you don't know. They are. They do do crazy things. But at the very, very least, I would have a direct. If you can't write to yourself, 
uh, hold a director's board meeting and, and do it via the board minute. So yeah. really I should follow myself and not do any work rather than do a little bit of work um, and then... I think, you know. I think Max, that, that's a question that Andrew can't answer because it's a commercial decision you have to make. Yeah. There may be a situation where we're tempted to furlough because then we're going to get some free money from the government but actually commercially if you work you may earn more money right. than, than the amount that you would be paid under the furlough scheme so that, that's a specific question that you you, you can't right. advise on depending yeah. on the max yeah. what i i agree i totally agree with hannah there but max what i would say is let, let let's let's um just slightly come away from this grant thing what mm. it is about really is employee it, it's mainly look it's for employees of people that work for other companies that, that that's really what it's about not really for owner managed businesses and and for you what you don't want to do for three months to claim back i don't know how much it's going to be for you i don't know what your salary is but to claim back a thousand pounds or whatever it is and in the meantime, you risk damaging your business. Mm. It's, it's just not worth. It's just not worth it. Right. It really isn't. You don't want to damage your business for the amount of money that you're going to potentially get. I mean, you need to have clearly. You need to have this conversation with your accountant if you have one, um, and work out whether it's worthwhile. But if you know, if it's if it's only a relatively low sum of money that you're eligible for the grant then it's just it's just not worth it why damage why risk damaging your business you know you want to have something there when you come back well i um, the only thing is when you said it's a low sum of money isn't it the 80 percent that other um employees get pardon me isn't it isn't it 80 percent you said it's a low sum of money but isn't it 80 percent well it's 80 percent of your salary i don't know what your salary is so when so, you say salary <laughs> Max, I think we should just move on. You do eighty percent of whatever it is that you pay yourself on a monthly right. basis. Okay. Uh, thanks, Max, for asking your question. Joe, Sadie, you had a question. Well, we've had quite a lot of questions on the business interruption loan, and obviously today there was some news on the fact that the banks aren't being very fair about the business interruption loan and the percentages that they're charging. So I just wondered if um, either of you could. Ask. We've had a we had a question from Dov um, on that earlier, um, as well as I think somebody else. So if if you could ask about that, that would be helpful because it feels like they're not as easy to access as the government are promising. So are. you know what kind of yeah what kind of evidence would you try to um, to 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 show to help to show that you you could get a business interruption loan. Uh, okay, Michael. All I can say is that <clears throat> the last time we had a shock in 2008, well, 12 years ago, when I was working at HSBC at the time, and, and at the time the government also um, introduced some uh, small business loans via the banks, and there was a very, very low take up. There was so much red tape around them. Um, the banks weren't offering good rates and there was very low take up. So my personal view is that these things aren't very realistic. I mean, I don't know what you think, Andrew. Um, well, my, my, my clients are saying to me, they don't, they, they don't really want to, they don't want to go for it because it's the same as applying for an ordinary business loan. It's a little bit of a, uh, smoke screen this is uh, the government is not giving the 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 um, you know the the business the money direct the, the banks are giving the business the money all, all, all the all the government is doing is guaranteeing 80 percent of the debt uh, to, to the bank and the banks are going to make you go through the same hoops that they would make you do anyway you're going to have to produce cash flows and forecasting um, so um, look it's worth going for if your business needs it. You need to identify the need. You've got to do a forecast. Um, and then uh, if you do need it, then you should go for it. Um, but I wouldn't go for it just, just to get money in uh, as, as a buffer. That, that, that's what I wouldn't do. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's the same. The banks will put you through the same hoops that they would normally do, in my, in my opinion. 
I think from what we're seeing and from what I've seen in the media anecdotally that um, they are making people jump boots. and the reason why people are going for these loans is because they've got short-term cash flow issues so it's all very well being able to furlough your employees but you need to have money to pay them while you're waiting for the government grant so that's why using something like the HMRC time to pay scheme to delay your tax payments and your VAT payments um, will help um, some businesses find the cash flow to cover their short-term needs at a cheaper and easier way than um, applying for these loans. We've, we had a question through on the um, chat about the um, business grants. Um, my understanding is that they are available to businesses that are rateable, so therefore have a premises. Is that, is that your understanding, Andrew? Yes, that, that, those grants. That, I mean, apart from the grants for uh, employee reimburse, you know, for employees and self-employed, those grants you do need to have a premises, uh, and at the very least, be getting small business rate relief. Um, so, you know, it, it, even if you've, you've got to be paying rates, you've got to be paying uh, rates to the local council, um, and then you should hopefully get at least ten thousand pounds if you get small business rate relief. And the local authorities are administering that themselves, I believe. Yeah, they'll just write to you. Um, um, yeah. We've also, it's nice to see somebody is still hopeful in these times. We've also had a question saying, um, are there any other grants available at the moment? Um, which I think is wishful thinking at the best of times, but I stand to be corrected. <laughs> um, I think that, I think we've got what we, I think that's what we have now. That, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. On some personal finance questions, um, we had a question, can, can I stop paying into my pension? Michael, what do you think about that? Well, um, it's difficult for me to give individual financial advice in this setting, but um, I'd be happy to talk later about it on an individual basis. But in terms of paying into pension, most personal pension schemes allow you to start contributions, stop them, increase them, decrease them. Um, so, it's worth speaking to the to your IFA or to your uh, pension provider, but normally they will allow you to do that. What I would suggest is that if you can pay something, keep paying something because it, a lot of pen, pensions is a key thing about 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 pensions is not just how much you put in, but when you put it in. Uh, right now the markets are at, a, at still at, still quite low, and it's a good time to keep putting money in if you can. Uh, and also, the the longer the money's in there, the more compounding and return you get before you start taking your income. So it's best to keep contributing if you can, even if it's at a lower rate. Um, but normally, most schemes will allow you to start, stop, increase, and decrease. Okay. And what about ISAs? Can you close an ISA early to get some cash out? Okay. So uh, yes, you can. Uh, but uh, it, it might well depend on what it's invested in. For example, if you've got some property funds in there, a lot of, most property funds now have closed their, uh, have suspended trading um, because they're unable to get their property valued because you, they can't get surveyors out to them and they have to legally cease trading until they can value their assets. Um, <clears throat> so other than that, you can. Um, however, if you sell out now, you'll be selling if you have an investment IC, you're selling at a low point. So it's like selling something cheaply. It's like if you had a, a house, um, you'd rather sell when the market's higher than when the market's lower. The risk you have is selling out now at a low point and then potentially putting money back in when investments have gone up. So it's like selling a house for £300,000 and then having to buy it back again later on for £400,000. Um, you can do it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, I'd, I'd see it as a kind of a last resort, but yes, you you can technically do it. Um, if the market's low and you're lucky enough to have a bit of cash flying around, is now a good time to be buying shares? Uh, as I said, I can't give individual advice in the setting, but generally, I would say the market is low, and if you do, if you do have some money which you do not need and will not need for a long time, then it's worth speaking to your financial advisor um, about putting more money in and. But not just putting money where nilly, it's got to be appropriate to your risk profile. Um, to give you some idea, the clients that I have, I tend to be medium to low risk. And we've um, put together portfolios which are 
risk managed so that when the when the markets when the markets went down when it went down by sort of 37 38 percent um a few weeks ago my clients were worried but they their product portfolios went down by around 10 percent because we managed the downside risk so it's important not just to put money where nearly um expecting to to make a big return the mar the market will experience some ups and downs as we go along and it's what's, what's very important is to make sure that you uh um, you manage um, the risk and you put your money into the things which are right for you so that you can afford to have some ups and downs as you go along. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we've just had a question in um, that says that if you are not making any money from your self-employed status and you go and get a job at a supermarket or in a care home or all the jobs that are recruiting at the moment, would that affect your um, self-employment grant? uh it, it it may do because you have to be in self-employment as of now and you i believe have to be um continuing with self-employment the answer is that it, it may do it may do because there has to be uh a an objective of continuing with self-employment afterwards i believe uh, i'm not 100 percent sure on that but it could it, it could do we need to see the questions that that are issued um there are some vague conditions about what you're doing now and so you have to be in self-employment now in order to be able to claim it okay and i think the idea is as well you have to be in self-employment afterwards as okay. well hopefully the intention is that afterwards you're in self-employment if you go and get a full-time job for example that may that may potentially and i can't say 100 percent certain with certainty that may invalidate it that would need to be checked out okay okay thank you um have you have we missed any top tips that um you gentlemen would like us to have covered there are some top tips actually Ooh. Uh, funnily enough, <clears throat> no, um, um, I think that at the moment, one of the key things is to help us all get through this uh, is to uh, manage our money, manage our budgets, and manage our, our, our personal and business outgoings. And a lot of us are sat at home now um, with the internet, and all the magical thing is you can buy on the internet from home, and it can be quite tempting. And there are some things that uh, I don't know any any anybody experienced the impulse buying on Amazon or eBay. Hands up. Yeah. 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 I admit to it as well. I'm terrible. Um, one of the th things that you can do is use the basket on on Amazon. So if there's something that you you're looking you you're looking at the internet, you're thinking, oh, I really need to get a an X Y Z, and um, it just comes into your head. So you can find a thing. Put it in the basket, shut it down, come back tomorrow. If you still want it, then you can buy it. Because um, if you have an impulse to make an emotional purchase or something, that impulse will go. Um, I've had uh, I've had clients that do all kinds of things like buy clothes online because they wanted to feel like they're younger. Um, and, and then when they come, they look at them and think, I can't fit into this. And then either send it back or forget to send it back. And then they end up with a cover full of clothes that they're never going to wear. So um, putting, putting in a pause between the decision to buy and actually buying can help you to keep to a budget. Um, another thing is about budgets generally. Budgets are the kind of things that people never really want to follow through on. Um, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if, you are, if, if you are financially stretched, you may well think, right, I need to do a budget. You'll do a budget. Some people are, are good at monitoring those on a regular basis, which you have to do to make sure you're sticking to it. But often some people don't because they're worried about judging themselves or what they're going to see. And there's a way around that. It's called having an accountability buddy. Um, so an accountability buddy would be somebody else that's also doing the same thing. And you have a, you have a finance meeting online together to go through your numbers with them, with each other. And that means you can be accountable to the other person. They can be accountable to you um that they've stuck to their budget um uh, a few other things usual things around um uh, your uh, utilities um i suppose everyone here's got a gas or electricity bill or a mobile phone bill or whatever or a water well most companies are different but 
Um, but it's worth going on to some of the comparison sites to see, particularly like you for example, to see if there's any, any, any way cheaper of getting, uh, of, of getting your, your electricity or gas bill down. Um, and also now at the end of the winter, um, maybe worth calling at your gas company to see whether there's any credit in your account. Um, I've had a number of people that have done this and they found there's about six quid sitting on the account and you can claim it back. So it might help a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, um, but there are also some charities out there as well to help people if they really are struggling with, um, with, with money, like for example, paperweight. That's my, that's my list. Anything else, Andrew? Yeah. I've got uh, a question. Yeah. Um, I'm, I didn't see from the beginning. So if I'm a self-employed, I need to go back to the accountants to give me the last three, three years and then they are following to the HMRC or I'm so, still the we, we covered this earlier and we've got a recording, but just as a short answer, HMRC okay. will contact you with the information. So, okay. um, but um, I'll email you separately after this because we're coming to the end now, okay? All right, thank you. Andrew, your top tips? Well, all, all I um, the most one of the most important things I would say here, um, and that is in view of the future. It's one of my mottos: is don't let the tax tail wag the dog. Um, and what I mean by that is all this stuff about furloughing, for example, in particular for people that employ staff or or themselves uh, as directors. You, you must be very, very careful not to damage your business. Please God, when this is all over, we'll all have a business to go back to and things will return to normal. But if you lay people off temporarily and you stop work temporarily, you may get the grant back, but there may be other organizations out there that are not doing that and, are, and could take your business off you. Uh, because they're ready to do it you know say a, a firm of accountants as an example if we just close down and say we're not doing accounts we're furloughing all of our staff you know and then another accountant out there you know hasn't done that somebody wants their accounts done will go to that other accountant um, so it's very very important that you in any decision you make you don't potentially damage your business so it, for the sake of a few thousand pounds, it depends how much money we're talking about, but at the end of the day, look to the future, look to where you wanna be. Do your clients still need servicing? Don't cut off the service to your clients just to save on some wages. That's what I would say, but obviously you need to be able to pay those wages and that, that is a big if. Uh, the other thing is as well is anybody that's got VAT to pay, they don't need to pay any VAT, which is falling due between now and the end of June. And my tip for them is um, you don't need to pay it. It can be deferred until March 2021. But more importantly, a lot of businesses pay their VAT on direct debit. Um, don't automatically think that your direct debit will be cancelled for the, for the VAT. It won't be. You, so if you pay your VAT by a direct debit and you want to defer it, you need to speak to your bank and get them to cancel the direct debit. Um, uh, and the only other thing in line with what Michael said is look at your outgoings, see what you can cut reasonably. Um, and I'm talking from a business point of view as well as a personal point of view. Lots of businesses pay subscriptions, advertising, promoting things, um, those, those can be cut in the short term. You can always go back to it later. Mm -hmm. so look, look for any costs that are not absolutely necessary. My, Michael hint, uh, talked about utilities. They're a prime one as well. If you've got business premises, for example, you know, you shouldn't be paying so much in utility bills and you may be able to shop around and get a better deal. So yeah, do, do look at your costs because there are costs that can be cut and that are not necessary at the moment mm -hmm. and just wait until we're ready to go again. Uh, that's more or less it. Me. I think that's, those are great ideas. Um, just adding on to your point about electricity and gas. Um, when you go into places like companies like, uh, sites like U-Switch, for example, try and look for the smallest providers. Don't go for the top six. Um, if you go for the smaller UK ones, you often get better rates. Right. 
Thank you. Um, we have come towards the end of our hour. We've just gone over slightly. So um, um, I'd just like to say a massive thank you to Michael and Andrew. You've done an amazing job. I can clap and people can hear, but other people can use their chat claps or <laughs> just use their hands. Um, thank you so much, gentlemen. Michael, thanks so much for the idea. We really appreciate it. Um, for those of you that are still with us, some people have left because they've got all of the information they need and their lives are sorted now. But um, <laughs> for those of you that are still left, we are running another business um, Zoom call on Monday, the 6th of April at 4 p.m., where we've got another one of our WeHub members, Brad Lazarus, who's going to be talking about taking an offline business online and how to try and um, create online revenues for a business that you usually don't um, have online. So hopefully that will be helpful to people. Keep an eye on all of our social media. We are updating it regularly. Remember that um, Joanna's here, Debbie's here. I'm not actually Debbie, I'm Hannah, if you don't know me <laughs> and you didn't uh, see the instructions at the beginning. So we are still working and we're here and we're very happy to um, to help you in any way that we can. And if anybody on the call would like to be put in touch with either Michael or Andrew, then um, you can contact Joanna and I and we would glad will gladly um, put you in touch with them. And um, thank you very much, everybody. Stay home. Stay safe. Stay safe. And also to have, a, if anybody wants a one-to-one -one business advice meeting to discuss you know, communicating with clients or, you know, anything on that, please, please do contact us. As Hannah said, we're here to, to help. Yeah, just one last point. I've taken a copy of the entire chat and Hannah and Joe will have that. So if you feel your question wasn't answered, uh, they'll contact you individually. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you for attending. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks for hosting. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.